found on the Geo Heritage uh, Division of the Geological Society, we've uh, we've taken as our brand the story of Earth and life, um, and our our mission is uh, telling the story of Earth and life. And our vision is telling the story of earth and life to the world. Um, there's something about South Africa, Southern African geology that's special. You can't quite put your finger on it, but in terms of one of the concrete things we've got is this extraordinarily thick craton, uh, old cold craton, which we don't understand. But um, somebody who has a better understanding than most of us on, on, on this craton is Irena Altmieva. Um, she's done amazing stuff relating the electrical conductivity to the geotherms. And more recently, she's um, got some ideas of uh, the buoyancy in areas where there's kimberlites compared to the areas where there are no kimberlites. Um, and hopefully, Irina will be able to tell us more about that today. Craig, over to you. Okay, thanks everybody for attending this uh, continuation in the series of lectures uh, during lockdown periods uh, all over the world. Thank you for attending. Um, as Chris noted, uh, September is Heritage Month in South Africa, so uh, Chris has organized a number of talks on the geoheritage front, of, the, of which this is the first one. Uh, Irina is a professor in solid earth geophysics and affiliated with a number of universities. Uh, I'll let you go through her details on the, um, on the Google Calendar uh, drop down, which you can see, uh, but she's been affiliated with uh, uh, the Helmholtz Center in Germany, Stanford University, China University of Geosciences, the Russian and USSR Academy of Sciences in Moscow, uh, University of Uppsala in, in Strasbourg, um, and has worked at the U US Geological Survey and is professor of geophysics at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark, and that's where she's sitting now in Denmark. Uh, she is the author of a monograph with Cambridge University Press on the lithosphere and interdisciplinary approach and co-author of research uh, papers on diverse aspects of continental dynamics with a focus on the thermal structure of the continental lithosphere, which is after all the fundament fundamental uh, basis of where our geoheritage comes from. Um, Arena has been a member of national research councils and accreditation panels in several European countries. She was a council member of the European Geoscience Union and presently is a task force leader on mineral resources of the International Lithosphere Program and council member of the International Heat Flow Commission. So Irena, with that um, brief introduction, can I get you to share your screen and hand over to you? Yes, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, so then I'll just share my screen and uh, we'll start with my presentation. I hope you can hear, you can see it. We can see it. Carry okay. on. Excellent. So thank you very much for the invitation to uh, contribute to this uh, series of uh, lectures related to geo heritage in uh, Southern Africa. I think it's a fantastic initiative, and uh, I'm very much honored to, to start with this uh, uh, lecture uh, lecture series. So what I'll be speaking today is a uh, geophysical perspective on uh, the uh, structure of the lithosphere in Southern Africa. And before I start on this, I actually would like, oh, let me, I have too many screens. I need too many people between them. Okay, I would like first to start with uh, some general introduction of uh, what is unique about the cratonic lithosphere worldwide, so that we sort of, you know, have the same, uh, our perception of uh, and to the same approach uh, to uh, the discussion. So <clears throat> when we speak about unique cratonic lithosphere, obviously the first things which come to mind is uh, the uh, very uh, great ages of uh, the uh, crust and the lithospheric mantle, the presence of a very thick lithosphere crust, and also <clears throat> the presence of a uh, lithospheric mantle with a unique composition. So all in all together, it comes to uh, 
buoyancy of uh, cratonic lithosphere, so that it's very difficult to recycle it in subduction system. It also comes uh, to the stability of the lithospheric uh, structure in the cratons, so that it's very difficult to destroy it by mantle convection. And all of this leads to long-term survival and preservation of the cratonic lithosphere. A good question to ask is uh, why it is unique and uh, uh, if we destroy the presently existing cratonic lithosphere, is it possible to recreate it in one or another settings? And so the answer to the last question is no, it's not possible. And so the entire um, reason for the uniqueness is related to the secular cooling of the mantle, which is a reversible process. And it means that uh, the <clears throat> lithosphere, which was created in the Archean times, was formed at mantle temperatures about 200 degrees uh, higher than the present temperatures. So which means that you have completely different melting conditions in the mantle and you create a lithosphere which, is, which has unique properties. There are two important concepts which relate to the lithosphere. One is uh, chemical boundary layer. And uh, <clears throat> the reason for this is that lithosphere is created as residue of mantle melting and sure, as I said, higher mantle temperatures in the early Earth produced cratonic lithospheric mantle with a unique and highly depleted composition. So usually uh, the depletion is characterized by Mg number or first rate content. And sure, one of the comments which I want to make here is that sure, actually um, many of the studies, on which are, many laboratory studies on which geophysical interpretations are based, focus only on uh, experimental data on olivine properties. But this makes only 60 to 75 percent of the mantle. So that uh, there is some um, uh, problem actually when we compare geophysical observations with their experimental data. So, uh, but uh, speaking about chemical boundary layer, which implications it has? Well, it has a strong meaning for uh, geophysical observations and geophysical interpretations because experimental data shows that there is a strong effect of iron depletion on seismic velocities, in particular on shear velocities, and also on densities. Which means that if we have any anomalous mental composition, they should be seen in large-scale geophysical models. Another closely related aspect is that the lithosphere is a thermal boundary layer. And it's very simple to understand, very easy to understand, because by definition, lithosphere is a layer with a conductive heat transfer. And what we have is very high temperatures in the mantle, about 400 degrees C in the shallow mantle, and then zero temperature at the surface. So the system has somehow to accommodate this temperature difference in about 1400 degrees C. And so this is exactly what is happening within the lithosphere. And this is how the lithosphere is formed as thermal boundary layer. So there are different approaches how one can calculate and estimate what is temperature regime of the lithosphere. One is coming from geophysical observations, which are mostly constrained by heat flow data. And so the other commonly used approach is based on xenolysis arrays. And so this figure shows uh, the comparison of uh, the results which are coming from geophysical observations. And so all of the symbols uh, refer to different uh, geographical locations where xenolysis arrays are available. And <clears throat> it's clear that there is, uh, well, two approaches give a very consistent result, uh, which is uh, quite encouraging and uh, gives uh, credits uh, to and um, uh, some solid basis for use of these uh, uh, jet arms. So another point which I want to make here is that actually if you look at the details of all of this distribution of the symbols, it's clear that cratonic jet arms are very different. So the blue symbols refer, for example, to Kapwal, and to the black ones refer to the Baltic Shield and yellow to Siberia. So it's clear that uh, the structure, the temperatures are quite different in these locations. So this is just another way of presenting the same. And uh, this is in list arrays, uh, which are based on a uh, Nimes Taylor uh, geothermal barometer. Uh, on the left uh, are the results for uh, South Africa. And uh, yeah, for comparison, I show the, uh, the results uh, for Siberian Craton and for the Baltic Shield. So these uh, uh, gray areas, uh, they show uh, the range which is typical for South Africa. And it's clear that uh, temperatures in the lithosphere of the Baltic Shield and the Siberian Craton are very much different than what is uh, recorded and reported for South African Cratons. So if you have different cratonic jet arms, it means that we also have different lithosphere thickness. It's sort of obvious so that two things are closely linked. And uh, 
if you look at this map, it's clear that lithosphere thickness is uh, the largest in the cratons of northern hemisphere, those which formed, uh, which at some point were part of Laurasia uh, uh, supercontinent. And to those which are in the southern hemisphere, including South Africa, uh, typically have a lithosphere thickness on the order of 200 kilometers only. And so this is also very well correlated with the data on the heat flow. So the typical heat flow in southern hemisphere cratons is on the order of 40 to 50 milliwatts per square meters. But in the cratons of northern hemisphere, uh, there are some crazy, completely crazy numbers which are reported on the order of uh, 20 milliwatts per square meter. So it's so half of what is, for example, measured in uh, cup flowers. All of this certainly has a pretty strong implications for the lithosphere structure and lithosphere evolution. Another point which I want to make, which is also important, is that a transition from the lithosphere to asthenosphere is not a knife catcher boundary. So what is present there is the transition zone. And uh, this, is, uh, this slide illustrates uh, why it happens when we speak about thermal boundary layer, because uh, the temperature difference between cartonic geotherm uh, and mantle adiabat is very large in the shallow mantle, but then it becomes smaller when we approach the base of the lithosphere. So that in this region, uh, this region really has a transitional uh, structure and uh, it's something, some kind of mixture between pure conduction and uh, pure convection and uh, the thickness of this transitional layer can be on the order of uh, 30, 40 kilometers. So if we speak about chemical boundary layer, we also have very similar pattern and we also have transitional nature of uh, uh, the boundary between the lithosphere and asthenosphere. So this is compilation based on different uh, uh, papers uh, published by the Griffin Group for different locations, different cratons worldwide. And uh, what they show is that, uh, well, if you look for the cratons of Southern Africa, for example, the transition is, uh, the, the change in the composition is uh, very much gradual and so there is no sharp boundary here. So that again, we're speaking about transitional nature of uh, this uh, lithosphere atmosphere boundary. So on and all, it means that, well, we have two major boundaries from physical point of view or chemical point of view, thermal boundary layer and chemical boundary layer. And both of them have the transitional boundary at the base, which makes it very difficult to determine this boundary by basically any type of methods. It also explains why there is so, so much of controversy in, for example, seismic uh, interpretations of how thick is the lithosphere in different uh, cratons. Another concept which is closely linked to uh, chemical boundary layer and thermal boundary layer is the idea of cratonic isotechnicity, well, which means nothing more than just equal density hypothesis, uh, which was uh, proposed by Jordan uh, many, many years, well, 50 years ago, basically. And uh, his idea was that um, high densities at uh, room conditions, uh, which are caused to low temperatures in the cratonic atmosphere, are almost exactly balanced by low densities, which are associated with the basal depleted composition. And sure, this idea was based on very few paradotypes from Kapval and also few paradotypes from Siberia. And so one can actually argue uh, how representative it is and what is the meaning of all of this. And so this idea, uh, um, as a hypothesis has been uh, addressed and uh, criticized from various points of view, and I'll uh, show the results later. So <clears throat> uh, this uh, isopechnicity uh, idea uh, was uh, um, also compared uh, uh, with the results uh, uh, for uh, not only for Kapwal uh, data, but also for Tanzania data. And uh, this red line in both plots uh, shows the predictions by this isotechnicity, and it's pretty well compared uh, to the results uh, from uh, uh, both of the cratons in Africa. But uh, all of this is based actually on studies of uh, Kimberlite host azimuths. So one may ask a series of questions. How representative is this azimuths data from Kapwal? How representative is illness sampling in general? And how does the lithosphere mantle look so where uh, there is no illness data? So I first uh, try to address the second question, how representative is illness sampling? Well, when we speak about cratons, we sort of, uh, well, the cratons are default, uh, 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 defined uh, by default as stable continental blocks. 
but she, if they're stable, it means that she, no one should expect to, their, uh, to have any magmatic activity or any tectonic activity. So which means that uh, eruptions uh, which uh, bring um, uh, Zinless uh, uh, and uh, which cause kimberlite eruptions, uh, they are not normal conditions uh, for the cratonic evolution. So then in addition, these eruptions uh, occur only in specific locations with a potentially a typical structure or the lithosphere. And kimberlite magmatism by itself may also modify the composition of the lithospheric mantle. So it actually raises the question why kimberlite hosted mantle zinlis uh, should be considered representative in the first place. So then talking about representativeness, uh, for example, of uh, uh, cup wall data, this is uh, a test of isotechnicity for the data for, for Siberian craton. And we used two different approaches. Uh, one was based on the gravity data, the other one on buoyancy. And in both cases, regions uh, which are expected to, to be at either technicity state should be white. And uh, you can actually see that those are only Kimberlite provinces which fall into these white regions where isotechnicity is uh, expected to exist. So that, well, on one side we have this uh, uh, Zinless data from Kapval, which says that uh, isotechnicity should be there. So we're looking at uh, the results uh, for the Siberian Craton and then says that isotechnicity is only in the Kimberlite provinces. And uh, what we believe is happening is that uh, what is sampled by Kimberlites is uh, somehow metasomatous lithospheric mantle, because uh, the blue regions which have the most depleted lithosphere are not sampled by Kimberlites. So now let's look in detail uh, at uh, Kapval from geophysical perspective. Well, the first question which I always have in my mind is how cratonic is the cratonic lithosphere of Southern Africa. Well, this map shows the magmatism of different ages, which are, in my view, should have reshuffled and completely modified the lithospheric mantle of the entire uh, uh, craton in Southern Africa. And nonetheless, this region is still considered as a typical archaean craton. And probably the reason is that it is so well studied geochemically and we have so much of abandoned high quality data so that we believe that we really understand what is the composition and the structure of the cratonic lithosphere. We recently looked at uh, an isotropy in the capital craton. So many of you probably know that there was quite a debate between uh, group, uh, two groups, uh, one of uh, Paul Silva and the other one of Lev Winnick about the origin of mantle anisotropy. But uh, what uh, we discovered for the first time is that there is actually an extremely strong crustal anisotropy. And this crustal anisotropy is extremely well aligned uh, throughout uh, the Kapfal uh, and Zimbabwe cratons. And it shows a striking correlation with the orientation of the giant dike swamps, which are shown here as gray background in these rose diagrams. So it means that somehow <clears throat> Crustal anisotropy follows the general orientation of the giant back swamps. And if the crust has been so much modified and so much affected, then the question is, well, what is happening in the lithospheric mantle? And if lithospheric mantle knows about all of these things. To look into the lithospheric mantle with the geophysical methods, uh, well, what we have is, and what we measure, we measure obviously the properties which are in situ conditions, which means that they have two components. They have chemical heterogeneity, which refers to chemical boundary layer, and we have thermal heterogeneity, which refers to thermal boundary layer. So that if we really want to look at the chemistry and compare this with Zinless data, we need first of all to remove the uh, thermal heterogeneity, and for this regional thermal model is needed. To start with, uh, for the Kapval thermal structure, the starting point here can be, for example, data on the heat flow uh, measurements. And uh, you can see that actually the data coverage, uh, well, it could have been <laughs> really a little bit better. And uh, from the other side, uh, it's uh, uh, quite heterogeneous. And uh, the general numbers are for the arcane parts uh, around uh, what, uh, 40 to 50 is expected for the Archean cratons, and then obviously you come to high numbers when you're outside of the Archean region. So uh, playing all of these games and all of these calculations, one can come to uh, the model of the lithosphere thickness based on thermal data. 
and it shows something which is uh, very well expected, uh, literature thickness on the order of 200 kilometers in the arcane part, and to then decrease into uh, uh, something like uh, 100, 120 kilometers in the mobile belts uh, surrounding the arcane core. Uh, what is uh, quite interesting is if we try to look at the secular trend and secular evolution of the literature thickness. And so this plot on the right, it includes data from all of Africa. It's not only from Southern Africa. So for example, you can see that uh, this uh, block refers to uh, the Manchild in West Africa. And uh, overall, it shows pretty nice trends uh, in secular uh, changes in the literature thickness. If we look at data from all other cratons, so there is nothing exceptional which is uh, happening in uh, Southern Africa. So it very much, uh, it, it nicely fits uh, the global trend, except that the global trend, as I showed before with the Dinlis Peter race, shows two very clear uh, types of the Archean literature. So one has a uh, very uh, modest literature thickness on the order of 200 to 150 kilometers, and there is the group which has much uh, thicker literature. So, now, once we have uh, the thermal structure, the, uh, the thermal model for uh, the lithosphere in Southern Africa, one can look in detail into compositional heterogeneity of the lithospheric mantle. And one of the approaches is to use uh, seismic tomography. And so then uh, these seismic velocities, uh, they can be sort of, you know, cleaned off from regional temperature differences. And with adding, you know, some uh, different types of corrections, one can determine what is uh, the compositional heterogeneity of the lithospheric mantle. So this is how it looks uh, for uh, Southern Africa. I show the profile which starts from uh, uh, Cape Fault belt and uh, then continues uh, into the Mozambique Fault belt. And <clears throat> this uh, black line at the bottom, it uh, uh, corresponds to lithospheric bases defined from seismic tomography. And uh, all of these different crowds, they show uh, compositionally induced variations in seismic velocities. So, uh, well, what is clear here is that uh, there is some lateral heterogeneity, and then there are also depth, depth variations of uh, seismic velocities caused by compositional anomalies. I'll show you later uh, that uh, what we actually observe here, so that these seismic velocities are significantly smaller than is expected for typical cratonic lithosphere. And this is probably caused by a firm enrichment of the lithospheric mantle uh, beneath uh, all of Southern Africa, which is uh, uh, something which one would expect uh, remembering how much of different magmatic events uh, uh, took place in this region. Uh, it's interesting to compare uh, these uh, results with uh, what is coming from uh, Zinlis studies. And so this is uh, the plot here on the right is based on a um, couple group one uh, Zinlis published by uh, the group from Carnegie. So they actually observe quite a sharp boundary, quite a sharp transition at the depth of about 110 kilometers. And I put this dash trade because, well, the vertical scales are different. So I put this uh, line here. So their results refer to approximately this region. And this is also where seismic velocities show the transition from fast cratonic velocities to something which is definitely not uh, really cratonic. So if we now compare this with other regionalist data, so this is what was published by uh, the group by Griffin uh, some 20 years ago. So uh, they were uh, comparing two generations of uh, Kimberlites, uh, group one and group two. and what they concluded was that uh, uh, in the old uh, Kimberlites, uh, they observed for a chemical, uh, the base of the chemical boundary lay at, at the depth of about 220 kilometers, which is here. And uh, to me, it's quite peculiar that it so nicely corresponds to uh, the base of the seismic literature in Kapval. But so what they observe in young Kimberlites is uh, literature uh, based, uh, the base of chemical literature at much shallow depth. And so this is again approximately corresponds to the transition from fast velocities in the upper part of the lithospheric mantle to much uh, slower velocities uh, in the lower part of the lithospheric mantle. Well, how do other cratons look like? You know, is it something special for Southern Africa, or do we observe the same thing in other places? So this is the map view of um, 
seismic velocity anomalies uh, cor uh, corrected for temperatures. So you're looking at purely compositional variations in seismic velocity anomalies. So uh, the left one is for depth of 100 kilometers, and uh, well, all cratons look uh, pretty much the same. But if you look at the depth of 200 kilometers, uh, well, Southern Africa looks sort of anomalous. Well, uh, South uh, America also looks anomalous, but uh, other places like Australia and cratons of Northern Hemisphere, they definitely have a much stronger compositional signature at the depth of 200 kilometers. So again, looking at uh, cross sections, uh, the upper one is for Australia, and it has been chosen in the region which basically doesn't uh, cross any Kimberlite provinces. And what you see here is the very, very uh, typical fast uh, velocity cratonic lithosphere. Then at the craton edge, it, cross, it goes uh, to a much slower uh, seismic velocity, something which is exactly what would be, you would expect as a classical example of cratonic lithospheric mantle. If you look at the bottom one, uh, bottom profile refer is uh, for uh, the Canadian Shield. And uh, again, the Croton edge uh, from Cordillera to the Wyoming province is pretty uh, clear. Then we are going into the Cratonic lithosphere of trans and origin and sus Craton with a very, very strong signature of the Cratonic high velocity uh, lithospheric mantle. But then when we enter the region of uh, Jurassic Kimberlite, Again, the pattern is the same as what, was, what I showed you for the cup valve. The seismic velocities are low and they definitely are not uh, typical for uh, pristine or intact uh, cratonic lithospheric mantle. Uh, this example is uh, from Europe and uh, it has been chosen again to illustrate the same point. So these are two profiles. Uh, the left profile um, doesn't cross any Kimberlite provinces. So the craton edge on both sides is very clearly resolved in seismic velocities. Again, I remind you that you're looking only at the compositional component. Temperature has been removed from this uh, seismic velocity anomalies. So it's very clear, very high velocity core of the craton, which is preserved in this part of the East European craton. But when you go to the right profile, the right profile here in this northern part crosses one of the major Kimberlite provinces in uh, the Baltic Shield. So that the Southern part, which doesn't cross Kimberlite areas, again, has a very strong uh, cratonic signature with very fast velocities, but the Kimberlite region doesn't have this. So the um, interpretation of this is that uh, slower seismic velocities are associated with the metasomatic reworking of uh, cratonic mantle in Kimberlite provinces. So just to remind you how the kappa looks again, because the color code is the same in all of these cross sections which I showed. And you see that uh, there is basically nothing blue, nothing high velocity in the uh, uh, lithospheric mantle of uh, kappa. So that uh, basically almost no pristine arcane mantle is left uh, in uh, Southern African cratons. Now let's look uh, at the same problem with a different perspective. and. Uh, uh, the way to look at this is to uh, look at completely independent data set and to uh, look at uh, mantle densities. So again, uh, the uh, procedure is very similar to the one which I uh, uh, showed you earlier for seismic tomography interpretations. Uh, so uh, one needs to remove uh, temperature, lateral temperature variations. Uh, but here another problem is that first, uh, one also needs to remove gravitational effects of the crust because we want to look uh, below the uh, crust and, uh, into the lithospheric mantle, which means that we also need to have a reliable crustal model. So what uh, we used to for this study is uh, the results uh, for uh, mock interpretations based on uh, phase seismic uh, experiment. And so the major difference with the other similar models which were published uh, by several groups of researchers is that uh, in this interpretation, in this uh, uh, model, and we allowed for heterogeneous crustal VPVS ratio, which means that we allowed for crustal compositional variations. So what it shows uh, is the, the results for uh, mental densities. So these are mental densities which were uh, recalculated to uh, SPT conditions, which means room temperatures, so that it's possible to compare them directly with the xenolith derived uh, densities. And sure, well, you definitely uh, will agree that uh, the entire thing looks extremely heterogeneous with very significant variations in the density uh, structure across the region. 
So what was uh, nice for me to see is, and I marked this as uh, this number one uh, uh, here with the arrows, uh, is that even small details are resolved. So until I made this map, I was completely unaware that uh, there are also some Kimberlite pipes in uh, the Cape Fall belt. And uh, this pipe nicely falls exactly in the region with the uh, highly depleted uh, cratonic type litostrate mantle. Another point which I want to make here is that, uh, well, uh, this uh, purple area with very low densities, it doesn't have uh, any uh, kimberlite, except maybe for the region in uh, Zimbabwe Craton, uh, but uh, which means that uh, to a huge extent, uh, the structure uh, from a geochemical point of view, the composition of uh, lithostrike mantle in uh, regions uh, which from geophysical perspective should have low densities uh, is unknown. So uh, now coming back to uh, the pecnicity, which I was mentioning to you before, well, uh, you saw that uh, in the Siberian craton, uh, all as pecnicity, uh, the regions which uh, follow as pecnicity are all within the uh, Kimberlite provinces. But uh, Southern Africa is all one huge Kimberlite province. So one would expect that it all should be close to the pecnicity. Well, it is not. And it shows, again, huge variability with some parts in particular around the pop up belt uh, having too heavy mantle and other parts uh, having too light mantle. And what is really peculiar is uh, how lucky was Jordan with his hypothesis. I put the stars for the locations of Kimberlite pipes from which he used his, um, uh, he used the periodotypes to constrain his hypothesis. It's uh, really unbelievable that he exactly took uh, the locations uh, which are pretty close to isopecnicity. Okay, but uh, uh, what it all actually means and how it can be used. So, well, many of you obviously sitting in uh, Southern Africa know that uh, uh, it's all uh, has big implications for mineral exploration. And uh, uh, this uh, map just nicely shows uh, how um, the different types of mineral resources uh, are um, correlated with the density structure of the lithospheric mantle. What else uh, correlates with this lithospheric mantle density structure? Well, here I'm showing you the results which are at in situ conditions uh, because I want them to compare with other geophysical data which is also at in situ conditions like seismic tomography results. So this is uh, <clears throat> the map on the uh, right uh, shows the seismic velocities at 100 kilometer depth. And it's clear that there is correlation between the density map and seismic velocity map. We go deeper to the depth of 150 kilometers. This is the results of the Carnegie group. And again, there is quite a good correlation between the two things. Well, if we look at the Moha depth, there is also a very clear correlation that blocks with a low uh, density of the lithospheric mantle have thin crust. What is also peculiar, we compare to this uh, with the Moha sharpness. Moha sharpness is defined by seismic velocity contrast across the Moha. And again, there is correlation between the mental density structure and uh, the Moha sharpness. We also tried to look where kimberlites are most located, and it's clear that uh, kimberlites prefer regions where the Moha is sharp. So that if we summarize all of this together into sort of, you know, some geodynamic interpretation, this is how it appears. So the map on the left shows the data count. It's like data density. Uh, and it's clear that there are two completely different uh, types of uh, lithostrike mantle in Southern Africa. One is uh, kimberlite rich and it has uh, low mantle density. The other one is kimberlite poor with a higher mantle density. And what we believe was happening is uh, well, you start with the pristine arcane mantle, which has a uh, sharp moha and relatively thin crust and highly depleted litostrack mantle. Well, then you start introducing some basaltic melts, and uh, well, for example, this can be uh, associated with the uh, kimberlite magmatism, so that uh, mantle density is becoming a little bit increased. But uh, then you may also have in the regions which are affected by very strong um, magmatic events, extremely strong uh, metasomatic reworking of the lithospheric mantle by basaltic melts. So these basaltic melts uh, uh, rise up to the moha, and so then they accumulate it around moha, and uh, they basically become, uh, from the point of view of seismic velocities, uh, part of the crust. So that uh, the crust of thickness increases, and so the moha is becoming transitional, and so that there is no sharp contrast across the moha. And uh, this is what is happening in Kimberlite poor regions. 
So it is possible, at least this is what we speculate, that strong chemical reworking uh, of uh, cratonic mantle did not favor later Kimberley type of magnetism. Well, we also observe a very clear H flare progression in uh, modification of the lithospheric mantle if we look at uh, kimberlites of different ages. So that kimberlites are uh, with uh, old ages all uh, are associated with the depleted and low density lithospheric mantle. And then group two has slightly increased uh, mantle density and group one kimberlites, the young kimber, uh, which sample are young, uh, recently reworked lithospheric mantle have already very high density. So that it probably reflects the progressive uh, change in the metasomatic reworking of the lithospheric mantle in Southern Africa. Well, again, the question is, uh, is it something unique? How does it look in the other cratons? And I'll show you examples uh, from three cratons. Again, it's European craton, uh, Siberia, and also North China craton. So this is how mantle density structure looks in the Siberian craton. And uh, uh, probably the most important uh, uh, conclusion here is that uh, kimberlites do not sample most depleted mantle, as I said before. So this low density anomaly corresponds to undisturbed arcane block, which is anabar shield. And from a chemical perspective, we simply don't know what is the composition of the lotus fragmental there. And then when we go to regions which were disturbed, for example, by Paleozoic creation in this part and also in this part, they have, they have mantle which basically has a fertile composition and which is undistinguishable from Paleozoic mantle. Uh, this is an example from uh, the East European Craton. It's actually, it was uh, the study which was made for a much uh, bigger region, but I chopped off the map which only has uh, the continental part. And uh, uh, what I want uh, to uh, uh, stress here is that, well, we compared uh, uh, mental density structure in the regions which are sam sampled by uh, Kimberlites. And what we observe is that, well, a huge number of our kimberlites are hosted in the mantle or came from the mantle, which has the densities similar to what we observe in Kapwal. Well, there is also the group of uh, kimberlites which are non-maniferous and which probably correspond to this part of uh, structure in the capital mantle. But we also have the group of kimberlites in the East European Craton, which sample uh, lithospheric mantle with extremely low densities, and uh, we do not have such uh, data in uh, Southern Africa cratons. Uh, one more comparison is with the North China craton, uh, because uh, there is a common perception and understanding that the cratonic lithospheric mantle in uh, uh, North China craton has been removed or modified and basically is absent. And uh, this common interpretation is based on uh, the idea that uh, the Mesozoic Pacific subduction has uh, chopped away uh, uh, somehow the cratonic lithospheric mantle. And so this is correlated with this uh, topographic ramp from low topography to high topography, which is also believed to be associated with the uh, reworking of the lithospheric mantle. If you look at the left at this map, and so this is the latest fragmental density, again, at room conditions uh, calculated uh, from gravity, you see that actually the structure of the latest fragmental is much more complicated. And it is very patchy, similar to what uh, we observe in Kapwal, similar to what we observe in East European Craton. And um, it's not that simple. So that, uh, our interpretation actually contradicts uh, the uh, previous models and uh, we argue that uh, Pacific subduction alone cannot explain this uh, heterogeneity of the lithospheric mantle density in uh, North China Craton. We actually uh, believe that uh, there is this uh, large uh, pristine uh, block of uh, um, arcane uh, lithospheric mantle which probably is associated with the flood subduction of the Yangtze Craton. But uh, what I want to show, what I'm also showing here is that uh, this idea that uh, the entire lithospheric mantle was removed by the Pacific subduction goes back to Zinli studies. And uh, all of them are just uh, from this uh, eastern uh, Pacific margin of the Craton. And uh, well, uh, <clears throat> those which refer to uh, the Mesozoic uh, um, situation are 
indeed within the lithosphere, which has a very fertile uh, density structure, but to those which are believed to be uh, cor to correspond to pristine arcane mantle, uh, they are not uh, in our interpretation, in our results, uh, it's not pristine mantle, but it's also uh, significantly rocked like uh, uh, the composition of the um, lithospheric mantle in Southern Africa. So coming to the summary of all of this, so is the literature structure of uh, the Southern Africa Cretans unique? Yes, definitely it is unique. Well, first of all, it has uh, experienced unusually extensive magnetism, so that it's difficult to believe that uh, it still preserves pristine uh, fishes of arcane mantle. Well, it also has uh, warmer geotherms and as a consequence thinner literature than in several other cretons, in particular in Northern Hemisphere. So this difference is uh, quite striking. Well, it also has unusual crustal anisotropy. Such crustal anisotropy, to my knowledge, was not reported for any other cratons anywhere in the world. It also has non-cratonic uh, uh, seismic velocities in the lithospheric mantle after we remove the temperature effect. And it also supports the idea that uh, substantial part of the lithospheric mantle uh, lost its uh, pristine arcane signature. The same is uh, supported by uh, density analysis and the analysis of mantle uh, uh, gravity. And also we observe a very unusual correlation between uh, the crustal structure, the structure of the lithospheric mantle and uh, the kimberlite localities. So to sum it up, well, it comes to the big five uh, questions about uh, or, um, um, observations about the cratons of Southern Africa. Well, first of all, that the literature of Southern Africa cratons has a series of unique characteristics. Second, any type of magnetism strongly modifies the structure of the cratonic mantle, and uh, the Southern Africa literature in general lost much of its pristine arcane signature. Well, number three, that in general, globally, we do not have any geochemical data which uh, comes from pristine cratonic mantle because it's not sampled by kimberlites. Number four, mineral resources are strongly linked to the lithosphere structure. And in particular, in cases uh, which I showed uh, for Siberia, uh, East European Craton, uh, Canadian Shield, and also uh, Southern Africa, kimberlites typically erupt along the edges of the pristine cratonic mantle. And finally, in the cratons of Southern Africa, crustal structure and literature uh, mental heterogeneity seem to be very well correlated so that uh, whichever was happening at the time of the formation of the literature or at the time of modification of the literature structure, so the processes are coupled. And uh, once we know the that uh, the crustal structure in one place is anomalous, it also means that the structure of the literature mantle also should be anomalous there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Irina. Chris, carry on. Yeah, do we have uh, questions? Um, could, could I start with a question, Irina? Um, yes, please. Prist pristine cratonic mantle, is that, that's not, that, that is too light on your diagrams. Uh, yes, uh, on which one? Um, when, uh, you have areas that are too light. Is it, does that refer to, is that correlated with pristine cratonic mantle? Yes, yes. This is my interpretation that uh, when we have a very uh, light, uh, very low density lithospheric mantle, that this is uh, most likely the part of the pristine lithospheric mantle which uh, did not uh, undergo much of her working. I don't know to which an extent it is really still pristine and uh, if it is uh, the same as it was uh, when it was formed in the Arcane, but it's definitely uh, much closer to uh, the composition of the original lithospheric mantle, cratonic, I mean, uh, Arcane. And these areas that are too light, are, are there, there, there must be other pignicity at some depth. Is, is there some anchor that's holding these down? Well, it's uh, difficult to say. Well, uh, we all know that uh, the topography uh, of uh, Southern Africa, uh, Cretans, is extremely high. 
and that sure it's on average something like 700 meters higher than uh, all other cratons globally. And uh, it's clear that there is some dynamic contribution from the mantle which maintains this very high topography. Uh, I think that the answer to your question is that uh, what will happen if this dynamic support is removed? And uh, I believe that it can be that uh, there can be some chemical subsidence of uh, the entire region because it is so much modified. So I think that high topography is maintained only by a contribution from the mantle flow. Right. Uh, any, 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 anybody else out there with some questions? Maybe just one for me. Uh, carry on. Yes. Um, oh, hi, um, Irina. I wanted to ask um, on your graph, the one that was showing, sorry, the picture that was showing the pristine mantle. How is it related to the mobile belts? Because I saw the I saw the pristine mantle and the other types of mantle that you mentioned, but I didn't see the mobile belts. Is it, are they related in any other way, the pristine mantle and the mobile belt of Southern Africa? Yeah, well, we definitely see a difference in the structure of uh, the uh, lithosphere in uh, mobile belts and uh, in the alkene cratons. But uh, if I look at, uh, um, uh, the density structure of the lithospheric mantle, but then there is a very, very sharp transition from still depleted uh, lithosphere of the uh, arcane uh, part of um, Southern Africa and uh, uh, mantle of the mobile belt. Mobile belts definitely have extremely fertile lithospheric mantle from geophysical point of the geophysical approach. And I think that it's uh, pretty well uh, increased with what is coming from uh, Zimbabwe's geochemistry. Uh, what is uh, more surprising to me is uh, when we look at um, seismic uh, velocities, uh, compositional part of seismic velocities, uh, this change is not so clear. So that uh, there is uh, some compositional component uh, which actually uh, sort of, you know, levels to this difference in seismic velocities. But in the density structure, the transition is extremely sharp. Does it answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. It's very difficult with uh, all of this uh, Zoom uh, presentation because uh, <laughs> I cannot go back uh, to the slides and uh, come, you know, show the one which I have in mind. But because it will be put on YouTube, you, you will have a chance to go back uh, to those slides and uh, have a look yourself. Irina, would you like to comment on um, your interpretation of where the source rocks of kimberlitic material, kimberlitic rocks uh, originate? Are we looking at lithospheric or sublithospheric source regions? Oh, I don't know. I, I really, I'm not, I'm not ready to uh, answer such a question. Uh, I do not have full understanding of uh, how this uh, kimberlite magmatism initiates in the first place. But uh, my understanding is that uh, it's uh, probably uh, something which uh, originates, uh, well, at least generates uh, within the cratonic uh, lithospheric mantle. And I think that uh, um, uh, the, uh, this correlation between mantle density and the number of kimberlite pipes, it actually suggests that uh, kimberlites are generated somewhere within the lithospheric mantle. So that when you have a very fertile mantle, well, you, you, you cannot have this type of explosive uh, carbonatitic magnetism. So this is how I see it, but uh, I am not a geochemist. So maybe my answer is uh, too naive. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Is Alan Jones out there? He is, he's remarkably silent. I uh, don't know what to say. <laughs> Oh, Alan, at least you can say hello, and it's nice to hear you. In this uh, hi, great, great talk, uh, Edina. Tell me a bit more about the North China Craton, why you think that has such an elevated uh, Ordos platform? Oh, that's a good question. 
well, we're actually working on this at the moment. We do not have clear answer to this. Uh, but uh, what uh, it, uh, uh, well, in big terms, what we believe was happening uh, was that the Kraton was reworked uh, from several uh, sites uh, at different times. Well, obviously, you know, on the Pacific side, there was this Pacific subduction, but then we believe that uh, there is a big chunk of uh, preserved pristine lithosphere, which came from young the Kraton. And so uh, there can be something similar sitting on the northern side. And um, orders just happen to be caught in between all of these things uh, because uh, there, there is also uh, some uh, type of uh, rifting events in uh, trans North China origin, uh, which probably modified uh, completely the lotus rack mantle in that region. So that we we'll basically have a mosaic of um, different terrains which preserve very different uh, chemical signature corresponding to different uh, magma different episodes of uh, magmatic uh, or tectonic reworking. Yeah, great. I I'm a little disappointed being a Canadian that you didn't discuss the slave crate on more. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there is not much data on the crystal structure. You know, for whichever I am doing, I need to know what is the crystal structure. So if you can convince the Canadian government to go there and, you know, put a lot of uh, seismic stations, because what we have at the moment is so sparse, it, it doesn't really justify any targeted uh, effort uh, uh, in terms of modeling uh, for the slave pattern. Are there any more questions or comments? Going once, going twice. Irina, thank you very much for a very comprehensive lecture. Um, things have advanced quite quite well in the last 20 years as far as our understanding of uh, cratonic structures go. And we're probably still asking many more questions about it. Um, so thank you very much for your lecture. I'd also like to very much thank uh, our, our sponsor for the month of September, Tacoma Strategies, uh, led by Matt Mullins, who has generously helped um, support these lectures. Uh, you, can, you can see the Google, Google Calendar for upcoming lectures, uh, as well as um, stay tuned to the various communications you'll get from the GSSA offices. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on what is a very rainy and stormy Thursday, Thursday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon in uh, Cape Town. So thanks all. Thank I'll you, end bro. the meeting shortly. Thanks, Irina. Ciao. Thanks, Arena. Thank you, Arena. You're very welcome.